In November 1918, after four years of World War I, Germany's Emperor, Kaiser Wilhelm II, had been forced to abdicate. His armies were being ground down by a remorseless offensive by British, French and US troops. His people faced starvation. But already, a dangerous myth was taking root. The German generals and troops claimed that they hadn't been defeated in battle, but betrayed by their own cowardly politicians. Even so, at 11 in the morning on November the 11th, 1918, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, World War I came to an end. The following month, President Woodrow Wilson of the United States arrived in Europe, promising to create a new world order. He persuaded the world's leaders to sign up to a new League of Nations. At the Treaty of Versailles, they agreed that from now on, disputes between countries would be resolved not by fighting, but by debate in the League. The peoples of Europe were set free. Germany's ally, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was dismembered. Out of it, new nations were created. Austria, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. Germany itself was greatly reduced in size. But this process contained a time bomb. Not everyone celebrated the birth of countries like Czechoslovakia. Several of them contained substantial German minorities. One day, the desire to reunite the German peoples would come to haunt Europe. The war-torn German people also had one final indignity inflicted on them. They were forced to pay a massive 6.6 .6 billion pounds in reparations to France and Britain, something they could ill afford. And when he returned to America, Wilson's new world order immediately fell apart. The US Congress decided it could not risk being sucked into another war in Europe. It refused to join his league, and the US withdrew into isolationism. Germany was now a very different nation. It was still Europe's biggest country, but its militaristic monarchy had gone. It had become a democracy. But its government, the so-called Weimar Republic, was soon struck by a series of hammer blows. Street battles erupted between extreme right-wing nationalists and communists trying to start a revolution. Then in 1923, the country was devastated by hyperinflation, which reached hundreds of percent a month. Ordinary people's savings were wiped out. This was fertile ground for a new breed of rabble-rousing right-wing politicians. Among them, Adolf Hitler. Hitler had been born in Austria. He had fought bravely as a soldier in World War I and been awarded the Iron Cross. On returning to Germany, he settled in Munich, and his fiery oratory soon enabled him to seize control of the small National Socialist or Nazi party. In October 1923, Hitler and his henchmen attempted an armed coup against the Weimar government. It failed, and he was sentenced to nine months. In prison, he wrote a book, Mein Kampf, My Struggle, in which he blamed Germany's ills on the Jews and demanded that it rebuild its strength and seek new territories in the East. On his release, he set about building the Nazis into a proper, disciplined political party. From now on, he would use the democratic system to achieve power. 
But for the next five years, Weimar Germany prospered. Support for extremist parties, left and right, dwindled. Then suddenly, Hitler's opportunity arrived. In October 1929, the US stock market crashed. Billions of dollars were lost and an economic depression swept across the world. Unemployment in Germany soared to over six million. Only extremist politicians seemed to offer a solution. Politicians like Hitler. By 1931, his Nazis were a true mass movement. And they had their own brown-shirted thugs, the SA stormtroops, who numbered almost three million. In the 1932 elections, the Nazis became the largest party in Germany's parliament, the Reichstag. But Hitler refused to join a coalition, leaving parliament paralyzed. To break the impasse, President Hindenburg made him chancellor in January 1933, head of the government. Within a month, the Reichstag burned down. Hitler accused the communists and demanded emergency powers. He then used them to ban all other political parties. In August 1934, President Hindenburg died. Hitler declared himself president. He was now absolute leader, the Führer of Germany. At first, there was little sign of what was to come. For the next three years, the Führer concentrated on rebuilding Germany's economy. He spent millions on public works including the 5,000-mile autobahn system, to soak up the unemployed. But in secret, Hitler was also spending lavishly on a huge rearmament program. Under the Versailles Treaty, the German army had been limited to 100,000 men. The country was forbidden to have an air force, tanks or submarines. This small army was trebled in size. Then, in 1935, Hitler came out into the open. He unveiled a brand new air force, the Luftwaffe. It had two and a half thousand planes, far more than Britain or France. Unemployment plunged and the Nazis became enormously popular. Now emboldened, the Führer made his first expansionist move. In 1935, he reoccupied the Saarland district on the French border, after it voted to return from League of Nations to German rule. A year later, he sent German troops into the Rhineland, part of Germany which had been demilitarized at Versailles. At the time, many felt that Hitler was only claiming back what was rightfully Germany's. Neither Britain nor France objected. When Berlin hosted the 1936 Olympic Games, the Nazis were seen by many as firm but fair. A government which was restoring the nation's pride and which didn't threaten anyone. Of course, there were signs. The 1935 Nuremberg Laws forbade Jews to marry true Aryan Germans and deprive them of their citizenship. But when the first threats came to world peace, they didn't...